questions from the audience? Right. I was just wondering if you guys could talk about how you go about um, finding the style of the film at the beginning, you know, how, how you discuss it. And well, we looked at a lot of early Italian Denver, you looked at Eclipse, the Melka, and La Ventura. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, like most directors, have a, you know, a little short list of reference films, you know, that you start coming up with, which I usually work for um, most anything you do. You know, uh, you know, you want the cinematographer to see Conformista and uh, Euclid and uh, performance. But uh, also there's part of a, a kind of a, a larger discussion. You know, you get into the general questions. Is it mise-en-scene or is it montage? How long are we going to hold the takes? Uh, how compositional is it going to be? Uh, are we going to, um, is everything going to be driven by coverage? You know, these are also budgetary consist, uh, considerations. Uh, what kind of light is it going to be? You know, how hard, how soft, how white, how colored? And, and then you know, the conversation sort of goes back and forth, and out of that, in reference to other movies, uh, a model starts to emerge, which of course then hits the reality of, uh, of shooting. <laughs> I mean, I, I I assume that that is sort of the template for both directors. Yeah, but, but the unique thing for me working with Paul is, you know, he works on big Hollywood budget films, but on his own films, they're more meager budgets. He has the shots exactly in his head. He knows where he's going to cut. But almost, you know, been well shot this way. Right? knew exactly that cut would go to that cut, and he doesn't shoot for coverage. And another interesting thing for me on this film was you never repeat the same shot. In other words, if you're in a close-up in one size on one person and you cut back across, you never match the same shot when you go back and forth. You always want to change the image. Yeah, I mean, I, in fact, I, 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 I got rather obsessive about this, about never using the same shot, or I mean setup, never using the same setup twice and always um, orchestrating cut to cut. So that if you're doing a dolly this way with three people in it, when they are doing a certain action, you're going to cut. And the only thing that really matters in their matching is if when she says yellow, and I say, okay, I'm going to drop this place, and she says yellow. So at that time, she has her hand on his shoulder, and you have your hands on your hips, okay? The yellow, boom, you're all doing that. We got the cut. <clears throat> and that's, you know, that's when you start shooting cut to cut. And um, it was interesting because um, a lot of this came out of uh, Bertolucci. It was a big influence in mine. And, uh, and I've worked and worked on creating a kind of a, a classical style. And uh, it was a very interesting experience because I haven't talked to you since then. <laughs> the last couple of years, I, I did this film, The Walker, and I, I got bored doing that. I said, this is all too good. You know, this is too classy. It's too, it was that kind of a character. And, and so I, the next film I did, I said, let's, I said, I, I'm getting sick of well-made films. Uh, let's, let's. So we went um, multicam, bungee, uh, and uh, mismatches, um, uh, jump cuts, off-axis cuts, everything, and uh, and it just sort of symbolized in my mind the sort of death of the well-made film. I just feel that. Uh, well, I have a lot of feelings about the end of the movies, but also uh, m movies. I, I, I sense this while watching Departed. I said, "Boy, this film feels old. How, how, you know, how did Marty get so old?" And uh, it's just that film styles have changed. Uh, Marty didn't get older in terms of his style. It's just that uh, we're in a whole other kind of film style. <coughs> But, but there is one interesting signature scene where he breaks the line, where the, 
the uh, scene with Dana Delaney and Defoe in the uh, cafeteria, and, and it's very jarring. Now maybe to the audience today it isn't so jarring, but then it's very disruptive for people where he crosses the line where he mismatches by going directly behind, having all that space with a pillar in it. But, yeah, well, I mean, I, actually, I, um, I remember when that happened because uh, we had set up on one side of the line and I was sort of, and the scene was quite long, and I had to find a way to reestablish geography. Because basically, that's what you do. You have a long scene, you work your way in, and then you have to pop out again, reestablish geography, and then work your way back in. Otherwise, you're just stuck in close-ups forever. And, uh, and so I was thinking, that, you know, how, what angle should I reestablish the geography at? And I was watching it from the other side, and I saw this pillar there, and suddenly the song by Merle Haggard came into my head. Somewhere between your world and mine, there's a wall that I can't see through. And I said, well, that's sort of like it is. Somewhere between her world and his is a wall he can't see through. Let's go back on the other side of the line and show the wall that they can't see through. But I had to get back to the other side to continue my coverage. And the easiest way to do that is you do it on an action. So I had him reaching forward, and then I knew I had to cut right then to get back on the other side of the axis. Uh, but... Um, <coughs> And often, uh, you know, when you're directing, you have all these plans. But if you're not open to that kind of thing, and sometimes it comes some, from something you're watching, sometimes it comes from a cinematographer who just happens to say, you know, don't you see what's going on here? Don't you see how this light is, is, is hitting them, you know? Aren't you going to do something about that? Aren't you going to exploit that? And uh, or as an actor who, you know, says I think I should say something else. And uh, and a lot of the fun of directing is that kind of riding, you know, mixing the, the enormous calculation that has brought you to this place, and the fact that the clock is running, and and at a certain point the clock will stop and and you'll be out of time. With the sort of fun of, of, well, let's try that. And if we try that, we'll have to sacrifice something else. But it's worth it, you know. What kind of um, process did you uh, work with Light of the City? It seemed to be so central. Was that in the script? Did that develop on the scene? And what kind of creative possibilities came out of being on the set, being in the city? Well, I mean, this is, the first, this is the only time I've ever shot in New York. You've shot in New York quite a bit, right? Yeah, so what did you do? Well, most of it was shot on real locations. Yeah, I mean, the only set we built was that uh, the Paramount Hotel, uh, uh, because the rooms were so small in the Paramount that I couldn't do that crane shot I wanted to do, looking down at them and dropping back. Mm -hmm. And so we had to build a mock-up of uh, the room at the Paramount. Uh, but everything else was shot on uh, uh, location. So also, I didn't want to do any nudity on location, and it's all it's all you know when such cramped quarters. It's all it's always better if you're going to do nudity to have a, a little more control of, over your environment. Uh, but that was the only thing we built, and uh, uh, everything else was um, on location. But in, in terms of New York locations, anything mm -hmm. that doesn't, uh, that you don't run into in any other city in the world? Well, yeah, it's, it's always happening in front of you. You know, we have our extras, but many times things happen in front of the camera that you just have to let happen because you're in the city. Mm -hmm. So. But I mean, what also what specifically about the light? The, well, what's wonderful about New York is there's so much light in the streets, I tried to work off of the light. You know, I tried to work off of what was there. You know, like a lot of the ideas visually, like where he's uh, selling the drugs to the guy with the German hat, you know, that, that the light was because that, that light was hard, it felt that way. 
I always like to go into the location and, and, and see, oh, I'll give you an example. The, the, the place where he buys the gun uptown. Now, I, I never would have lived through the uh, skylight like that, because nobody probably would have thought of building a set with a weird skylight, but that place really had a skylight like that. It was uptown, it wasn't. And, and so then you get ideas, or inspiration, or whatever, from the locations. And then that dictates kind of an idea about the lighting. I always like to see what makes that environment unique in itself and then implement that. Yeah, 